Welcome everyone to Mantras for Peace. Uh, today we are here with Dave Stringer, a wonderful musician, kirtan artist, uh, Grammy nominated, prolific recording artist and touring musician, among other many, many other talents, um, which we're going to uh, learn about from him, including yoga philosophy and, and a bit of neuroscience too, courtesy of your beloved dear blah. Um, Dave, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Nandra. Yeah. Oh, you know, there's just such a beautiful resonance every time I sit down and, um, and tune in with a fellow lover of sound and, and mantra and, and like a, a servant of the love through the, power of chant and um so i wanted to say thank you for that and uh really looking forward to this conversation right or i could say an an addict of the beautiful chemicals that my brain produces when, <laughs> <laughs> when i sing <laughs> touche there's a bunch of different ways you can go with this you could say yes yeah, great <laughs> servant of god or you could say yeah total junkie <laughs> okay, I like it. Let's 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 go there. Let's let's start there. Um, tell tell us more about that. You know, uh, I'm a, a a sort of a reluctant yogi. I always seem to kind of come in the back door, and it's uh, I mean, my whole story is actually starts with being hired to edit some videos for an ashram in India, and I, I really went there protesting that I'm not joining any cult. I don't need yoga. I don't want this. But it turns out that my resistance, um, and in some ways my iconoclasm, um, was part of the point. They wanted an outsider to come in and and experience yoga and chanting in particular strictly from an experiential standpoint. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that meant that I could ask any questions I wanted to, but they also weren't going to tell me anything, that I needed to learn this through the lens of pure experience. Mm -hmm. uh, because I wasn't actually seeking anything except for, I suppose, a paycheck in an exotic setting, you know, um, uh, it, it managed to use both some of my desires to kind of pull me in, but it, it also meant that as opposed to going, okay, I'm going to an ashram, I'm going to learn all this and I'm going to become enlightened or something like that. I was kind of like, yeah, well, show me. And the thing that was important was that the act of chanting was transformative. I mean, it's so completely changed up my emotional field. You know, it was mm. just to sing without belief invested in it at all was transformative. And when that happened to me, I felt, oh, if I invest even just a little bit of intention in this, it'll go even further. But subsequently, because it was a complete surprise to me, I'd been a musician before I ended up in India, but it was a surprise that I would end up being a, a, a kirtan singer. It's still surprising to me, you know, many, many years later. But um, it left me equipped in many ways to speak to an audience's resistances. And so I'm not playing to the person that came in there seeking satsang and, you know, and a feeling of at oneness with everything. I'm playing to the person that got dragged in with that person. <laughs> and you know there always is someone like always, that always like that you know okay you know i'll go to the football game with you if you'll just come to the chant with me right so i'm trying to reach that person um i'm trying to reach through those resistances and and find a way a, a language that we can speak together that creates some space beyond the the divisions that we find ourselves in Mm. So, how do you get them to sing what do you say how do you as a fellow chant leader and someone who's you know like a lot of people who are going to watch this are people who love to lead chant how do you get that that guy in the back with his arms crossed well there's how do you get him to do it there's a bunch of techniques here one is a sense of humor really helps 
I find because um, I find if you go into a chant and somebody's got all their spiritual regalia on and they're like, namaste, you know, it's like, okay. <laughs> let's Sorry. start like the fact, okay, that this is, this is an act of theater. Okay. And I mean, in the best sense of the word, okay, we are, we are presenting an experience in a way to try and make it available and transformational to people. Mm, that, we are using the um, placebo effect in the theater of medicine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's the it's, theater of sound and mantra. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and, yeah. and the thing is, is it doesn't matter as with placebos, the effect is the important thing. Okay. Correct. Yeah. And, and so actually a thing that I do is um, first I look at everybody I sing uh, an opening mantra for myself, really, just because you can show up to a kirtan and uh, sometimes it's rough just getting there. You know, it's like you got lost or like they didn't get the sound gear you wanted or there's a thousand things or you didn't get to eat or whatever. And you can show up and you just be like, yeah, I need to sing right now. And so I don't say a word until I've sung. Okay, because I need the first like five minutes to reset myself and, and, and to put myself in service of what's happening and to try and slip the bonds of whatever's going on in my head. Um, but as I'm doing that, I look at everybody in the audience, like as in like, hi, hi, I see you, I see you, I see you. I'm not trying to have an opinion. I'm just trying to look at everybody and, and acknowledge their presence. I think that from a standpoint of consciousness that 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 matters you know um because i'm trying to focus my attention on the people in the crowd and i'm trying to read the room so um i i try and introduce the mantras in a way that say look there's a lot of ways you could come at this one you can see this as a venerable tradition in that has all kinds of of, of philosophical concepts and practices behind it and you can enter in there you know you can sing with great love to krishna or shiva or kali or whatever or you can treat this as total nonsense just gibberish that you're going to sing and because the point is to get beyond your mind let's let's take words away from it and and try and get it ju just get yourself involved in pure sound you know mm. you can do that or you can look at it as beautiful, beautiful metaphors. You can say, yeah, things come together and they fall apart. Let's find the ecstatic, you know, in that act, you know, in, in acting of letting go or, you know, whatever the mantras are representational of. So I'm trying to leave some room for everybody to find their way in. Then I sing my ass off and play with really good musicians so that people are invited in. Like you can just get it as music. And I let people know, look, here's what's happening for me. Stuff's coming up and it's not always so nice. You know, it's not, I'm not your guru. I'm not trying to be a saint. I'm trying to engage in a transformative practice for myself, which means I might be singing to Krishna, but what's coming up inside of me is potentially kind of toxic. And I just know that the act of singing is going to shift the flavor of that. Mm -hmm. Ask people to trust that too. It's like, just do that and watch what happens. Give me 15 minutes and give me a chance, man. Yeah. I promise it'll be good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah you can't also you can't judge what's happening out there i remember uh um, a concert in toronto years ago and uh, there was this guy who just seemed so negative and you know everybody around him was kind of like mm, you know and i thought oh this is really bringing people down and you know, I was at that point a little bit lost in my sense of like, I'm leading this thing. And you know, you, there's plenty of ego traps, I'm sure, as you well know, as a performer, like you start getting a lot of feedback and you're like, oh yeah, I'm powerful, you know? And it's like, oh, well, so I started in some ways putting this like thing out there, like, okay, I'm going to bounce you from the room. You're bringing us all down, you know, like you got to go. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I'm kind of sending this energy and, uh, then I was surprised this guy gets up and he leaves. And I'm like, oh, whoops, 
Okay. I am powerful. I am powerful. I've got this <laughs> coming out, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and he stopped at the door on his way out and made a very, very clear point of catching my eye. You know, like he wasn't going to leave till I looked at him. And then he went, and I was like, okay. That wasn't what I expected, right? He gave so, you a namaste. Maybe a namaste. And I didn't think anything more about it until later that night I'm checking my email and there is a two foot long email. He's saying, you'll know who I am. I'm the guy who got up and left and caught your eye at the door. And he said, I want you to know that I went outside and cried for 20 minutes. He was like, I couldn't do it when I was in the crowd, but I, but the, the chant brought all this stuff up for me. And he said, it was so cathartic. I just, I just couldn't do it in front of everybody else, but I want you to know that that's what happened. Aww. And it was like, okay, one, I'm ashamed because like I'm an asshole. Okay. For like thinking I'm going to bounce you out of here Two, for judging. Well, you did, but not in a bad way. Well, you did bounce no, him out. <laughs> this was all happening in my head. Okay. At least I wasn't right, no. outwardly, but inwardly, I still have things to account for. Okay. But yeah, the thing okay. is, is that it struck me. I was like, oh my God, I feel nothing but humility and gratitude for this you know like don't judge the experiences people are having like it, just trust the practice of it just trust mm. the sound, trust the feeling of everybody play together that's there are a lot of life lessons packed in that story yeah, yeah. i mean his so his expression of of quote unquote negativity was the discomfort of himself rubbing up against his vulnerability and his tension point and whatever was going on in him that he was not feeling comfortable or safe to break down and cry in the middle. I mean, that's, that's intense. That's oh, yeah. amazing. Oh yeah. 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 And you know, we also were singing, I believe at the time, a Kali mantra in, oh. in, um, I want to say, it was like in Mukari Busant or something, something like with like a like a really minor, like flat kind of second, different. sharp third, you know, kind of like super mystical, you know, between mm. worlds, uh, you know, kind of raga, um, yeah. which of course nobody out there needed to know that, but you know, some awareness of what ragas do is yeah. important in this because they're like emotional. It's like the ragas are kind of like a emotional periodic table of elements or something mm, that's excellently put i've never heard it articulated that way before i don't think i ever articulated that way before either but you know but still it's it's like that um yeah. and uh and i've learned that even though i'm not a classical musician per se uh um i have traveled with a lot of people who are more learned than me and I've made it a practice to surround myself with people that I think are in some ways better than me. Mm -hmm. My name might be on the poster, but um, it, it could be someone like, oh, who else is on this bill? Oh, you're having Sheila Bringy, right? Um, Sheila Bringy has traveled a lot with me. We recorded a lot together and um, she knows a lot about Montreal yeah, she's tremendous and about Hindustani classical music yeah and uh it's been my privilege to learn from her mm. and learn from some of the table players who who've traveled with me and and I think it's important if you're going to lead something to always see yourself as a student you know uh, there's a lot of traps out there and we can look at what happens in the in the various intentional communities that make up this yoga movement I mean every guru falls and it's always the same story in some way or another. But there's an abuse of power or an abuse of trust. Um, and uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to get into that. You know, I see that trap. And, yeah. And, and I think at the point that you think that you're the teacher, you know, that's when you start to fall for it. So yeah. it's that we all remain students. I really am. I mean, I, I really appreciate 
what I'm hearing from you as a, as a, as a sense of studentship of the experience of being in the leader role. Like you have the main mic, your, your face is on the poster, um, but you're, you're in service to the experience that everyone in the room is having. Precisely. And I think as long as you're there for, I mean, speaking for myself too, it's like, as long as my focus is not me, it is them, it's us. It's what are, where are we going together? What can we do in this moment to make love sing yeah. through us? You know, then we're, then, then it's, um, it's likely that we're not going to fall into those traps. Um, right. We have to keep moving the awareness from the I to the we, I think. Yeah. Is, you know, is part yeah. Of yeah. Can you, can you talk, you, you've kind of, you've, you've left some little breadcrumbs in oh. your talk so far. I'd really like to hear you speak about um, the neuro, the, 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 sorry, I'm not using the right word, the, the chemistry, the brain chemistry of that I to we that happens in the Kirtan experience. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny because when I started having these experiences with Kirtan, I mean, I'll say it, there's a, a kind of, since that time, I keep saying, well, how does this work? You know, what's really happening here? Mm. Um, because you do feel a physiological response. So I'm like, well, how, what's working here? And, and it's um, consistent, right? Like you do the things and it happens. That's the experiential part. It's not, it's not yeah. really it, it's, mysterious it, or magical. It's I consistent. Point, I've, perf I've, I've led Kirtans in, I think 25 or 26 different countries. And, and, um, and I will say that the experience of, um, of chanting Sanskrit mantras is the same in Boston, Beijing, Berlin, you know, Barcelona, and <laughs> Bahrain. Right, Bahrain. <laughs> it's the same. And, and that's a really, really cool thing. It's culturally transportive. And people say, well, can't we do this in English? I'm like, well, yeah, we probably could. But the thing is, is that we think or in whatever language, yeah, let's do it in, in Mandarin or let's do it in German, but we're still going to get we're still going to run into the obstacle of our mind in terms of what we're saying. Like you have to get mm -hmm. beyond about and, 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 um, beyond a, a subject object experience, like the singer needs to merge into the song and, and, and the sounds of Sanskrit are transportive. And for the, and the fact that very few people actually speak it is helpful. Um, because it's like a vehicle for us to ride without us getting lost in a thought form, you know? Mm. Um, but that said, um, I, I want to give a little credit to um, uh, Dr. Andrew Newberg for what I'm about to say. Uh, he wrote a book called Why God Won't Go Away, which uh, has you know changed my life way back in the day. And um, I, I've worked on some proposals for some neurological surveys uh, or uh, experiments involving Kirtan. Uh, subsequent to that, the pandemic has put a stop to that for the moment. But um, but his books are, are really cool, and I recommend them to people. Anyway, um, he talks about the occipital parietal lobe. Okay, there's there's a there's a bunch of different functions here, and I'll try and be as succinct as possible. But in terms of the I we conflict okay um the occipital back part of the parietal top call it crown chakra part of the head is associated among many other things with our sense of our body image okay it's creating an image of like my body extends this far and the rest of the world is beyond that okay and mm -hmm. it's an image that's on all the time and and it's our neurological way of saying i and you Okay. Um, but when people chant, when people meditate, uh, MRIs have shown that the blood massively goes away from this area and uh, it becomes the technical word deafferentated, deprived of information. Mm -hmm. And um, 
when that part of the brain starts to shut off, the boundaries between self and world start to dissolve. When activity turns off there completely, one has a sense of merging with like with with all. Okay. And because you can see it happen on an MRI, it's a scientifically, you know, repeatable and validatable thing, you know, like they did a lot of experience with monks on this expert meditators, which you have to be because you've ever had your head in an MRI machine, it's really loud and noisy. So, you know, um, but to meditate in one of those things, when the monks would pull a string to say that they had entered this space, it was it corresponded with what they were seeing on the MRI. Okay. Mm. So, um, but there's two parts to this thing and I'm oversimplifying, you know, for the purposes of discussion, but the left side of the occipital parietal lobe is got a message that basically says, I am. Okay. The right side is contextual and it provides like, call it here. I am here. Okay. Those two, parts of the brain make up our sense of like self and world okay when you chant there and meditate there's two ways of then dealing with the parietal lobe one is if you are chanting to something whether that's krishna or jesus or however you do it um as you focus really intently the contextual part of your brain is is invoked so you at a certain point all the blood flow goes to the right hemisphere so you lose your self, sense of self and become fully immersed in like the the object of your attention okay mm. which is why you hear these bhakti poets go like and i merged into krishna okay mm -hmm. that's one approach mm -hmm. um another approach is to steadily withdraw your attention from the world and its sensual qualities and the brain reflects back on itself to the source of where the thoughts are coming and the blood flows both away away from both sides of the brain so the effect ultimately is no self no world okay mm. it's like you can think of it uh the guru gita talks about this image of like um when the pot is broken or when the vessel is broken the inside merges with the outside okay so the space within merges with the space without so you can think of our personalities and ourselves as being partly created by the occipital parietal lobe that says well here this shell here this is dave and everything else is not dave Okay, when you break that down and you don't have to do it all the way, that's the thing. Just a softening of it gives you a sense that the boundaries of self are maybe a little softer than you think. And from even an electrochemical standpoint, um, if you looked at somebody and said, okay, let's just look at hydrogen, okay, you would see clouds of hydrogen around you. It's like, well, where exactly are the limits of Dave? Every time he speaks, there's hydrogen going or oxygen or carbon dioxide. So we are essentially kind of clouds that think that we're solid. And, and our brain, <laughs> I like that. Our brain, <laughs> our brains say this, but it's scientifically val or verifiable. That's the thing. Right. You know, you're both an individual being and you, you can't, you can hardly scarcely be said to exist at all as an individual. They're both experiences are true. It's, anyway, that's part that, of what's going on. <laughs> it's only that's part of, part of what I, I, I love that. And I'm, it brings me to, it, it makes me curious. Is it, it does something similar happen when you fall in love? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Because there's a there's a symphony of neuropeptides that are also happening here. I mean, this is the thing. One reason why it's so hard to explain is that there's so many contingencies in, in one thing, mm -hmm. and another thing. Um, I, another thing that's going on here, um, for example, is that, I mean, all of this, what we're really doing when we sing, it's pranayama, right? So we're, we're modifying our um, autonomic nervous system by mm -hmm. our and it's something everybody understands because we all know that if you're like 
anxious or whatever, angry, people say, hey, take a breath. Okay? We're like, right. And we feel better. And, and that act of, um, of breathing slowly and deeply affects our parasympathetic nervous system, which is our relaxation mode. And um, if you want to get anxious, you can just start breathing really quickly and really irregularly, and you can induce a state of anxiety too, like the right. switch, right? Yeah. So when we sing together, one of the first things we're doing is breathing in unison. We're slowing our breath way down and mm -hmm. do, inducing a, a calming state, okay? Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is, is that the autonomic nervous system generally, like the, the hypothalamus is attempting to always create a state of balance in us. Like if we're too hot, you know, we need to cool down. If we're cold, we need to get warmer. Um, if we're too excited, we, the hypothalamus wants to calm us down, okay? And so usually the autonomic nervous system is working in a kind of sequential thing, okay? You know, the, the sympathetic um, nervous system, we get all excited, and then we have to switch to the parasympathetic so we can chill out, okay? But there are certain circumstances in which both sides of the autonomic nervous system are simultaneously um, uh, activated and they're working in parallel instead of in sequence. Mm -hmm. Singing and dancing are two activities that that have been shown to cause both of those things to happen. Okay. Mm. So first you get calm and as you get calm, um, this elicits a, this relaxation response that's elicited. The brain starts to release dopamine, um, and your brain waves shift from beta to alpha to a more relaxed state. Okay. Yeah. But, um, and parts of the prefrontal cortex show, shut down the part that's, you know, constantly dealing with like intentions and thoughts. Um, and, um, uh, as you as we do this simultaneously the music is repeating and it's getting faster and faster that stimulates our sympathetic nervous system gets us mm -hmm. excited but because we're maintaining this breathing pattern this regular breathing pattern the parasympathetic nervous system does not let go so we start to have invoke this crazy feeling of being both like super relaxed and super present at the same time. So like we're excited, but we're relaxed. And that feels really, really, really good to us. Um, as we get more excited, uh, things like norepinephrine uh, get, get released. Um, and um, we start to, though, the twin actions of, of sympathetic and parasympathetic start to then cause um, anandamide, my favorite name for um, a neuropeptide. Ananda means bliss for people who, who don't under, you know, know much about Sanskrit. It's, it's the bliss producing chemical. Okay. Mm -hmm. And endorphins, things like this are also released. Um, so the combined effects here produce a, a kind of a bunch of brain cocktails, mm -hmm. you know, dopamine, which is reward thing, serotonin, um, and oxytocin ultimately are released. Okay. And in those, those chemicals themselves, those neuropeptides create feelings of well being and particularly compassion. So oxytocin is what's released when we feel in love. Like, uh, apparently when a woman gives birth, there's a flood of oxytocin when, when the newborn is met, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we feel a flood of oxytocin after we've made love. Um, and so the, you can think of, of the kirtan as a kind of like crazy active, like group sex, which, you know, I'll, Say that carefully because I once got kicked out of an ashram for saying that. <laughs> but, Maybe just add the word sonic in front of it. <laughs> I suppose. But, but the thing is, is, that, is, that, is that the interesting thing is, is that when we do make love, a lot of the very same mechanisms are, yeah. are invoked. So it's a, it's a very similar neurological experience. Mm. Yeah, and I anyone... Anyone who has 
participated in a chant experience that really had that magic moment capacity, you know, where the music and the, where the vibe is just right, mm -hmm. can attest to that. Um, and I, I, it was about 7,000 years ago now, or at least that's what it feels like, but I, I went to one of your kirtans when you um, and Cece White were touring on Kauai. Oh, yeah. And um, that was even before I went to, had gone back to India to study Hindustani vocal and all of that. And that was such a good time. Thank you. It was like, it was so inspiring. Oh, cool. And, and yeah, I think it, I think, I think whenever, when, when we have an opportunity to go to something and do something like that, we should do it because it just blows open the possibilities of how, what we could experience in our lives. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know? And the sad thing about the pandemic right now is, of course, these the kind of experiences have been like super spreader events. We can't do it, you know, and yet it's something that we really, 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 really need. Um, yeah. The thing that I'm hopeful about is that when ever it's possible again to start having live music events, I think people are going to yeah. flock to things like Kirtans. Oh, uh, they, they, they will for sure. They will for sure, but I think it's been well. A side note, and then we'll get we'll get back to it. But I've had some really interesting experiences with um, basically lead, doing them online with people mm -hmm. at home alone in their rooms, having the same kinds of profoundly transformative, trippy, like all the same things are happening according to the reports. It's amazing. Yeah, and it, that kind of just, for me, it has elevated the, my respect mm. for the experience of the practice to the next level, and I already had a, a hell of a lot of respect for it. Ooh, um, that's yeah, cool. it I, is. But, 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 the, but, the, but the, the group, the acoustic, the heartbeats, the warm, warm bodies, um, you know, the social contact, we will thoroughly enjoy that oh. when it becomes safe again oh yeah and i mean i i love you know the feeling of being in a kirtan like you can chat next to total strangers and after you're done you just want to hug them yeah. you just you just feel so close and i'm like yeah there's a lot of reasons why things get torn apart in this world and we need more practices where you can just like feel deep compassion for you know the person next to yeah. you and yeah. you don't have to know about the neuroscience of it. I've been reading a little bit about, there's a part of our brain in the frontal cortex called the anterior cingulate, which is apparently associated with our feelings of compassion for one another. Mm. Singing, singing stimulates it. Yep. And, and we certainly need more experiences of feeling compassion for one another um it certainly would change up our dialogue one of the harsh things about this pandemic online era too is that when you're not in the presence of another physical person it's much easier to like assassinate their character yeah. um dismiss their views um and um and that that i think has been harmful in a lot of ways even as it has allowed us to communicate more widely um but yeah i i couldn't i couldn't agree with you with you more about that and i think that's one of the reasons why why i wanted to talk to people like you and you know people who i see are like holding holding a space of compassion and doing your thing and putting your your work out into the world and just like creating opportunities for people to do those practices that are connective rather than yeah. disconnective right. and um and yeah so could do you, do you have any other like if you could if you could wave a magic wand and uh and and get everybody who is interacting with everyone else online to do one thing <laughs> you know like what what would that what would that be what would what would your wish be for 
the kind of fracturing online world that we have and especially in the wellness community with the pandemic. Right, well, and this, the, is gonna sound, this is going to sound weird, but um, my wish for everybody is that they um, actually would turn off their social media and sit quietly with themselves. Mm. Um, because uh, it, it's really important to uh, have the experience of how much of the chatter that's going on is actually happening in your own mind. Um, I, I once had an experience um, after I came back from living in India, I, I, I came back to to Los Angeles and I just honestly couldn't deal with the whole with Hollywood. I, I wasn't sure what my place was in it anymore. Um, it all seemed illusory. And I'm fortunate that um, my family has a house on a lake in northern Michigan. And um, I went up there when nobody was there and from September to Christmas and watched the lake free the la you know, the leaves fall and the lake freeze over. But I was by myself for the first time, I think ever for three sustained months, more than that, four months, um, in which I didn't speak to anyone else. And um, I realized in that time that I still got angry. I still had all kinds of different moods going on and there was no one else to blame except for me. Like all this is going on in my own mind and I'm constantly making everyone else responsible for it. That's <laughs> oh, ouch. Boom. <laughs> like right? nail it in there. Man. Ow. Ow. And I'm still trying to remember that, you know, whenever I get all about something, it's like, 90% of the problem is right here. And unless you sit down and face yourself alone in quiet, you will never know that the, the, the thing that you're working against is something that you carry with you everywhere you go. It's not anyone else's fault, you know? And so that, that sounds like a wish. That sounds like a wish we could, populate the world with right there too everybody if everybody would just take responsibility for their own stuff we might actually be okay you know and i like i like a, that idea it's a struggle you know try i mean just in any relationship that you're in you know like I and mean, that's even the hardest thing in a you know committed sustained domestic partnership it's like oh yeah you want to see some finger pointing and blame placing you know it's like yeah, it's rough, you know, but um, that's what I would like people to do. And the thing is, in the end, what the kirtan does is it brings everybody to this place of silence. Mm. Like, I, that's what keeps me coming back for more. Like, yeah. nowhere else in no other ex circumstance that I know of is a crowd of, like, could be thousands of people can be, like, you don't have to tell them to be quiet. They are. And, and if they aren't quiet yet, then we need to do another cure time. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and that's my yeah. thing. I'm just like, you know what? If the crowd applauds at the beginning, I'm not going to say, please don't do that. You know, that's not what we're here for. I mean, appreciate it, but, you know, but I'll just keep going until they can't applaud, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like, love that. You just you know, keep going until they can't applaud. Yeah. yeah. And that's it, isn't it? You, you do all the repetitions. Of the mantra you do the chanting you do everything to get that one even if it's a nanosecond of pure silence yeah that's the sweet fruit at the end of the of exactly. the whole pilgrimage exactly you know? and that's all the teaching is in that it's in that silence yeah. it's in that silence yeah. and, and if everybody could just learn to not be afraid of that. You know, it's funny because, you know, musicians are always applauded for what they play, but yet it's the space in between things that makes the difference. You know, that's it's, where the transformative moment happens for each individual. Yeah. 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 So anyway, uh, that's, I guess, that would be my hope, my wish. Ooh.